Isn't it awesome when Jesus shows up? Something happens when Jesus shows up, when he's on the scene. Now, parades were not something that they were not accustomed to. They had had parades in this region of the Bible time before. They knew what it was to have some sort of a military triumph come through, and they would parade ahead of them all of the soldiers that were most notable that they had conquered. They would have the king on a horse, or they would have the royalty in a chariot that was fixed up with great splendor and regalia. And they would go through the town and the city with the priests and everybody else would be singing out the praises of the one who had conquered whatever they had been involved in. And they would honor that person. Occasionally a king might come on a donkey, but if a king did, it was a peace time that they would come. Most usually you would see somebody arriving in this triumph or this type of a Palm Sunday type parade that we call it, and they would be riding on a horse. They were making a statement, I'm all that. You can go ahead and tell me I'm all that. And they would be riding through town and everybody would tell them they were all that. The priests would burn the incense, people would wave the branches, everybody would yell out some sort of a slogan of affirmation. But on this parade, on this day, when Jesus is involved in this particular parade, He is the one who orchestrated, who initiated this. He set it up himself, and he said, we're going to have a parade today. This was something the disciples had been waiting for. This is something the people that were following Jesus were excited about. They were getting really giddy and uptight, wondering, man, what all this could be and the implications that could come with it. So I want to look today at the three big truths I'm calling them that show us how to embrace the kingdom of God as it happens and unfolds right before us, before our very eyes. And I believe that God unfolds his kingdom in different ways at different times, and one day we know he will bring about the ultimate setup of his kingdom when he returns in the rapture, and then whenever he comes to set up after that his millennial kingdom that will last a thousand years, and then a seven-year period will happen following, and then he will reign forever and forever, and we will reign with him if we trust in him. And if we don't, we'll be separated and apart from him forever and forever. So let's look at those big truths today about the kingdom of God that are kind of surprising, really, when we think about this part of the unfolding of his kingdom. That is this, Jesus chooses everyday things to achieve larger purposes. In other words, he uses some of the very ordinary things to achieve eternal purposes. You know, I send out a group text to a number of ministers and I encourage them. They're pastoring churches of various sizes and we're friends and so I'll send out a note uh, on a Saturday or on a Sunday morning just trying to encourage them to, uh, you know, go about their day in victory and faith and in triumph. When I send that out to them, I just remind them that really we're doing the Lord's ministry. And even if it seems small sometimes, it's really all about Him. And whenever He reaches into our lives and through us in a message, He touches eternity through us. And so today, I believe we're touching eternity right now in this very moment. And I believe God is using this moment with me standing here and us all together in this way to be able to touch into eternity. It's amazing to me how the Lord will use very ordinary things to achieve extraordinary purposes. The picture of the Last Supper is all over the world. People have it. Pam and I have a a porcelain model of the Last Supper that someone gave to us. Pretty big model of that. But Jesus, when he was setting that up as a for instance, he said to Peter and John, I want you to go on into the town and I want you to go to a certain place. There you'll find a guy with a water pitcher. When you find the guy with the water pitcher, you follow that person to the place, and that upper room where he goes is where we are going to go. Just tell him that we, we want that upper room. So they go on their way. They see this person just as Jesus said. I wondered, did Jesus already tell this guy, I'm going to be sending a couple of my disciples when I'm ready, and I want you to go ahead and let us use that upper room. Whether he did or not, he knew they, this guy would be there, and the disciples get there and tell him, and it's just a little water pitcher that was a sign that you're gonna find this guy that created that great moment where they would experience the Last Supper. It's amazing to me how Jesus will use stables. He'll use mangers. He'll use water and turn it to wine. He'll use a cross. He'll use a crown of thorns. He'll use tombs. 
He's about using things that are everyday all around us, and he uses them for extraordinary purposes. He'll use whatever you have at your home, in your garage, at your work, wherever you are. He'll be able to mine that thing and do something extraordinary with it. On this day, he said, I want you to go to a certain area, and in that town, he says, I want you to find, there's going to be a donkey, and there's going to be the young colt beside the donkey. I want you to get them, and here is a password that you're going to share. He didn't say it was a password, but it was. The Lord needs them. This was in the town where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. I, th I think Jesus would walk by there many times. I think he already knew where that donkey was. He had already seen that little colt there. He already knew these people, and he had said, when you go into that town, you go ahead and tell them that the master has need, the Lord has need of it. And they said, oh, sure thing, go ahead, you can have. And so they were able to turn loose in verse 3, because they turned it loose for Jesus' purposes. And Jesus rode into town, verses 6 through 8, and when Jesus was going to come into town, he's getting ready to do this parade, and he is doing this around Passover. There are many people around. His disciples are around. There would be probably the other hundred and so people for the 120 that would be in the upper room later that would be around. They are his followers, and they are with him, and they're in this moment getting ready to go, and they see that Jesus is getting ready to ride this colt. Now, if you are a cowboy, if you like to ride horses, if you understand anything about horses, you understand this colt has never been ridden. This is going to be an A number one miracle Jesus is going to do right here to say, I'm going to ride this thing. Are you kidding me? It's not going to want you on it. It's not going to want to, uh, to know what to do. He said, bring along the mom. So the mom is there. And now Jesus says, I'm going to ride this. So the people take off their coats and they start throwing them on the colt. They start throwing them on the ground. There are trees around. They grab the palm branches off the trees, whacking them off. And they're coming over to where Jesus is. Jesus gets up on this little colt and he sits down there and he is beginning this incredible, incredible journey. Isn't it something? Isn't it something how God will use the very simplest of things? He will use the everyday things of our life for some greater purpose. We think they might be window dressing, but to the donkey breeder, this was an important moment he never forgot. To the people that planted those palm trees, this was a moment they never forgot. If they're still alive, they never forgot. Because now they're using my branches. Now they're using my donkey. And people got involved, they threw their coat on. They probably didn't match. They probably weren't worried if they were old or new. They probably didn't care if they smelled or didn't smell. They went ahead and threw them out there because this was, a, this was a moment that was royal and exciting. This was a power moment and they were excited about it. Max Lucado in his writing about things here, he says, all of us have a donkey. <laughs> you, you might get that humorous thought going in your head, but all of us have a donkey. You and I each have something in our lives which if given back to God could, like the donkey, move Jesus and his story further down the road. Moses had a staff he used. David had a sling that he used against Goliath. Rahab had a rope she shot out the window so they would know it was her house. God uses ordinary things. At Christmas time, my mother and my sister decided that at my mother's house there, they were going to do something that they had never done and completely out of the box for them. They invited their neighbors to come to their front yard for hot chocolate, all kinds of goodies, and to sing Christmas carols, and they were going to light the candles together. They invited a few people from their church. They didn't know if anybody would show up, but when they went out in their front yard, they had 40 people there, many neighbors and some folks from the church. They started singing the carols, and a neighbor said, hey, I play a saxophone. Can I go across the street, stand on my front porch, and I play this song? Yeah, go ahead. And in the night air, they played that. They had a little fire pit they'd picked up at Walmart or I don't know where, and they, they lit those, and they had the warmth of the fire going for everybody, and it was a wonderful time. Somebody came up to him and said, we need to do this more often. We need to do this again. We've got to do something about this. This is the only time we've ever gotten together, but this was fun. 
And some of them said, do you go to church? What church do you go to? And they said, yeah, well, here's a donation for your church. Some said, what is your church doing? Is there something I could help with? Well, they were doing those, uh, was it Samaritan purse shoe boxes to send overseas or whatever? They do several thousand of them. And so people said, can we come? Can we contribute? Can we help stuff them? And so some of their neighbors ended up coming over and doing that. He uses, he uses everyday things, just everyday things. Sometimes we're saying, it's going to be great big, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be, he uses everyday things, (laughs) everyday things to achieve a larger purpose. It's what he does. It is a cup of cold water in his name. It is a kind word in his name. It is an affirmation in his name. It is maybe slipping somebody a few bucks if they need it in his name. It is doing something you can do to service maybe a computer for them if you know how. Or maybe you just help them out, lend them your car. It's in Jesus' name. He uses the ordinary things to advance his kingdom and he can do that right through every one of us. Second thing I noticed, a pretty big thing here. Jesus chooses the proper timing to do things. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time for everything. Time to live, a time to die. You know, time to plant, time to grow, time to harvest, all of this stuff. It talks about the timing of everything. Jesus chose this Passover time to bring the people to a decision about him and his lordship, his kingdom. He forces this not on a small gathering of people, but on a very large gathering of people. The people are at Passover now. They're having to gather in Jerusalem from all over that Middle Eastern part. From the northern region, they have to come down and be part of this celebration. From all of the regions around, they have to come in and be part of this. This was a time when they would come and they would celebrate the Passover. Now, the Passover is still celebrated today, differently, but still celebrated. Then, they are celebrating what happened back in Exodus, Genesis, Exodus. It's whenever Moses is leading the people out, and you remember what's happening way back in in the Older Testament, and when they were when they were under the pressure of all of Pharaoh and his army and they were having to make bricks and they were having to do this, they cried out to God, God, here's their cry. And then he sends the plagues. One of the plagues was the oldest, the oldest child, the oldest son was gonna be killed to get Pharaoh's attention when the death angel traveled through the land of Egypt. You remember that? But the Lord tells his people, and Moses sent out the word, listen, If you will put the blood over the doorpost, I'll pass over you and go to the next house. When I was a kid, we sang some hymns that were, some of them were pretty good and some of them were questionable, but they're not all good. (laughs) Quit acting like they are, they're not. But there was one that had good theology I felt about it, and it was, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. And we knew what it meant because we knew that story we studied in Sunday school. And so we knew what was happening, that the Lord was passing over. And so here we understand that the Lord is at work in their lives. They're all gathered together to commemorate that great day of Passover. And they're really amped up. They're really, I think at this point you could say they could maybe be giddy. You know, whenever you get ready to go on a vacation, you've worked so hard, you've saved for it. It's one of those long, big vacations. Maybe it's going someplace really special. And now you finally get off work. It's that last day you had to work. Now you're off work, and now you're ready to go on vacation. You're heading home, and as you're heading home, you remember, oh, I need to pick up something. You drive in, grab it, and then you go home, and you finish packing up. You get the stuff, and you're so amped up. You're finally at vacation, and you're excited, and you're kind of giddy. It's kind of that giddy, 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 ah, ah, ah. Or maybe you tailgate at a ball game, and you're out there tailgating and the grill's grilling and everybody's excited and somebody whips out a football and you go out for a pass and it's, you know, it's that giddy excitement. You got the giddy. Well, the crowd is amped up and they're ready to do something. They want to do something. And so Jesus knows all of this and Jesus orchestrates this and he gets that, he gets that colt there and they put the coats on and the coats on the ground and they whacked off the limbs and now Jesus says, we're going to have a parade and everybody is giddy and everybody's amped up and this is a time whenever something big is going to be happening. And Jesus is fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 from the Old Testament and it's happening like what's in Psalm 118 where it talks about there that there's going to be the grand entrance and the palm 
palm branches waving, your king is coming, it's going to be a grand experience, is what they're talking about in the Old Testament. And so Jesus' disciples are, wow, amped up. The Christians are amped up that are around him and the crowd around him, they're amped up for something to do and they start all getting into this. It becomes a big moment and they go from one end of Jerusalem over toward the other end of Jerusalem and we understand that these people are hollering out, Hosanna, Hosanna! And that really is a amped up slogan that they would use at, at, at politic time or you know for a government overthrow. Save now, save now, they would say say some sort of a slogan they would give like you're better off with Fedorov or something like that. <laughs> I just thought of that in here for a minute <laughs> that's a good one Kay. keep going baby <laughs> no they wouldn't have thought of that one but anyway they're coming through here in Jerusalem and as they're going through Jesus is thinking global they're thinking local Jesus is thinking eternal they're thinking temporal just save us help us help us. Jesus saying, nah, I'm thinking big picture. I got the big picture in mind. Jesus wanted to die and deliver the people that they're wanting to be delivered from. Ain't that something? Verse 10 says, the whole city was, depending on the translation you're reading from, it was stirred, it was moved. You can keep reading, it was shaken. It's a Greek word that we get our word seismic from. In Matthew chapter two and verse three, Herod, when the wise men came to tell him about Jesus, he was shaken, same word. He was shaken like, ha! Ah! And he says, as he tries to act calm, show me where I can go worship him. He didn't want to worship him, he wanted to kill him. He was shaken, the whole city was moved by Jesus. You see, Jesus knows the timing of doing things. At the right time, at the best time, at the fulfillment of time, Jesus will bring things about. And Jesus knows the right timing in your life today the right time to bring things together, to be married, the right time to have a certain job, the right time to go to a certain place, the right time for everything. He knows how to bring things together and to do things that you and I would never think of doing or know to do. He knows when to bring them together. He knows how to bring it all into existence. It is the right time that he does this. The right time for the text. The right time for everything. You've applied for how many colleges and you haven't gotten in. But here you are on the 11th try at some college. And all of a sudden you get the response. You're in. You're accepted. It was the right time. It was the best time. It was his time. It's the way he works. That's just how he rolls. You've been by the car lot. How many times you looked for a car? You wanted a certain kind of car. They didn't have a certain kind of car. Finally, you roll by the car lot and it's like, voila! And that car looks like it just elevates a little bit whenever you, you're there. It's levitating and it says, come by me, come by me. It's the right time, the best time. And you go in and you make a deal for the car because it is the right time. You didn't have the money before. You didn't have the right time. Now you've got time to go sit down and do it. The right time, he brings that together and here it is. And there's a third thought I want to bring to you, and that is this. Jesus chooses proper messaging when saying things. You and I are very much into messaging in our culture. If you don't believe it, look at the commercials if you have a television. And look at all the ads if you have your phone. You can block them. They're going to send you some more. And they are trying to create an image that think, makes you think you must have whatever it is they have. And they're trying to make you buy it, right? It is the messaging of that. Or you think about this, maybe you're single and today you were gonna be coming to church and mango and you, you, uh, you got ready and you were thinking, do I look okay in this? Did I look, look, look? You were thinking, do I wear makeup? What's my hair do with this? Oh, I gotta flip it this way, that way. Clean my glasses, gotta make myself look good. If you're a lady, may put on a little sparkle on your lip, all this stuff. So you were looking fly. You are messaging. Some of you send in a different message, but, you know, everybody's messaging something. And so everybody's in here messaging. Our church messages, your company messages. If you have some type of product you promote, you're doing messaging. Jesus was messaging, and he was saying the proper thing here. Verse 5 and 9 talk about it here. He's sending out a clear message. He was walking into Jerusalem with his disciples, and there are two, listen, there are two blind men that are sitting alongside the road. And they say something that is profound and powerful, and if you just read past it quickly, you'll miss it. It's earlier in the, chap the chapter ahead, chapter 20 of Matthew. Here's what they're saying. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Jesus identifies him. Look at this. Son of David. Son of David. To you and me, that doesn't mean that much, but to them it meant a lot. In reality, it means a lot to us, but then it meant Messiah, King. Before Jesus would say, don't tell anybody I performed this miracle. Don't tell anybody about what I just did. They wanted to call him king or crown him king over Nazareth. He said, not yet, not yet. Part of the crowd and he walked on through, went back up to Galilee. You remember that? And so Jesus in this moment here, he is, he is saying, you can go ahead and call me that. Matter of fact, go get the colt and bring it here. Aha. Uh -huh. You can put your coats on it if you want to. Really? Yeah, you can go ahead and throw some down. Go get some palm branches, guys. Go get your palm branches because we're getting ready to get something going in here. I love what Lloyd Ogilvie said about this. He, he said Jesus was a producer, the scriptwriter, the director, and the key character. Look what it says in verse 5 of your passage here. Your king comes to you. Your king comes to you. And then it says... He comes gentle to you, and he comes riding on a donkey. Your king comes, the verb tense there is, is coming, has come, is coming, will come. I talked about it a minute ago. He's coming back for us. Right now before their very eyes, he is coming. And he's already come, past tense, in the past. Had the virgin birth, here he is. And so we understand this is happening here, and Jesus is saying, it's okay. He comes gentle to you. He's not coming with militant acquisition on his mind now. He's not looking to take over an overthrow. Nope. Okay, fasten your seatbelt. I want to hear it click. Let me hear you click. All right, I heard a couple clicks. He did not come to overthrow Biden. He did not come to overthrow Trump. And as your pastor, we're fixing to head into political, uh, political times. I have a very strong opinion, but it's my opinion about the future. I do follow the news. I do know what's going on. Don't ask me what news I follow. I follow enough of it to keep abreast, talk to people smarter than myself and learn more. I don't follow all the TV stuff. I get sick of that. Turned it off. My blood pressure did better. But let me tell you what. They were under a regime they did not like. And Jesus did nothing about it. But he went forward. Get a load of this. He went forward with his own message and ministry. And you know what I'm going to have to do as a pastor? I'm going to go forward over the next few months and guard this pulpit the same way with the message of the ministry of Jesus Christ, clearly the mandates of Christ and the requirements of the gospel of Jesus Christ over the next few months. And as you decide on that, your own biblical perspective and understanding of that, and you go vote and vote for whatever you vote for, that's fine. But this is what I want for every one of us. I want every one of us to respect the values and our country to be peaceable, yes. But this is what I want. I want everybody that I minister to to come to know Jesus Christ without a doubt because at the end, it won't be Trump, it won't be Biden, it will be Jesus Christ who's sitting on the eternal throne and the job of the church is to promote Jesus Christ in the Bible. And that's what we're gonna be doing. I'm very aware, I'm very aware that the wall is open and many people are coming in. We need to evangelize them. I'm very aware of the economy. I pay my bills like you pay your bills and I help people out outside of my family like you help people out. But it's where we are in our life. So he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, okay, and put your coats on the, on the donkey and here we go. What does Jesus say by this? He says, I want to be king over, listen to this, I want to be king over all of your life. Every area of your life. Jesus let the crowds in this case in verse nine, look at it. He let them, he let them holler out the, the pronouncement they would make. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save now, a couple of Hebrew words, but listen to this, it means exclamation. Save now! It means acclamation. You can save now. And it also means supplication. Please save us now. 
This is what it means as I understand it and as I see it right here. But you've got your Hosanna that you're praying this morning. You've got your own Hosanna that you're praying this morning. Lord, save my marriage. Do a Hosanna in my marriage. God in my health, do a Hosanna. God in my raising of kids, do a Hosanna. God in my pocketbook, do a Hosanna. God, wherever the future is for me, do a Hosanna. And we pray this Hosanna prayer for God to help us out in our Hosannas, don't we? We pray them out all across this congregation. So Hosanna also means the coming one. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Look at that, who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> this is important for us to understand because Jesus is the one who is coming now into full kingship before the people's eyes. And he's letting them see him as he wants to be seen in this moment. John would ask several times and declare of Jesus, he is the one coming after I. I'm not worthy to loose his shoes. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, he says in John 1. All the way through there, he's talking about Jesus. Billy Graham puts it this way. He said, Christ also died like a king by virtue of his kingly office. He was the only one, the only one in heaven qualified to redeem the lost. And fully aware of the price of redemption, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for us. So God in heaven, the Father, hears this prayer of the people, this exclamation, acclamation, supplication, all this stuff. He hears it, save now! And here's how God answers it, different than we would, but how he did. He said, I'll save now, I'm gonna save with a cross. I'll save now, I'll save now with a savior for all mankind. For the Jews, for the Gentiles, for the whole world, Jesus is my gift. He hears the save now and he says, I'm gonna bring atonement. I'm gonna bring the atonement to you to give you the possibility of being brought into a right relationship with your creator, that you might be redeemed, that you might be forgiven, that you might be able to stand before me in all time and be in my presence in my heaven. He says, I'm gonna save you for an eternal kingdom that is beyond this world, that is beyond the regimes where people impose their wills and impose their ideology and people will do this and they will do that. Should we stand against evil? Yes, should we stand against bad Bad policy, sure, but should we stand for Christ always? Absolutely, and that is our highest aim, to be able to shine for Christ. I want my neighbors to know I am a Christian more than I'm a Republican or than I'm a Democrat. I want them to know that I stand for Jesus more than I love the Phillies or the Cardinals or the Eagles or the Chiefs. I want them to know that I love Jesus Christ in a decent and appealing way that they might be able to come to the Savior of the ages, the one who died for every one of us our rock of ages. He is the one. Hebrews chapter seven, verse 24 and 25 says it this way. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, therefore he can save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So right now what's happening? Jesus is seated at the right hand and what is he doing now? One thing he's doing is praying for me. Not to get tomatoes thrown at me at the end. for disappointing some and exciting others. No, he's praying that his message will get through. So we have two crowds really there that day because at the end, the others are gonna say, Jesus, tell them to shut up. That's religious people, tell them to shut up. You know they shouldn't be doing this. This is crazy. They knew the scriptures of prophecy and they said, no, Jesus, this isn't, this is not it, this is not it. And they were disappointed because they thought the Messiah ought to come and do a different way. Lord, you should have healed my family. God, you should have given me that job. God, why didn't it work out with that girl, that guy? God, what is all this? Kind of disappointed with God and we blaming God for everything. And God says, no, it's not about all the things working out. It's about are you gonna crown me king of your life? That's what it's about. And then there's the other part of the crowd, is they, they got all disappointed here. They want a political change, and Jesus didn't give it to them. He didn't bring it to them. He said, I've got a bigger kingdom in mind. I have an eternal kingdom. I want to get Jews and, and Gentiles, these people you hate that are Romans, I want to get them too. I'm dying for all of them. Stuart Weber in his writing said this. He said, Jesus would not exercise rule, listen, rule without redemption. And he doesn't come just for that. He comes to bring redemption to every heart. So I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. What do you say about Jesus? Have you made him king of your life? 
You cannot follow him halfway. You cannot give him just half the throne of your heart. If this is your throne of your heart, he comes into your heart and he says, hey, I want to sit first place in your life. And you say, but I'm sitting here. I don't want you to sit here. And he says, no, I want to be king of your life. And in that moment, he said to them, I want to be king in everyone's heart. Every area of your life, every part of your existence, I want to be king. He doesn't do a halfway king. He goes all the way or no way. We used to sing a song, King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Old English, but good truth. I give him first place in my life. Now, when we allow him to come into our heart and our life and be king, I want you to go down just past this passage that we just read here and we looked at today. Go down just a little bit more and see what Jesus did next. He goes into the temple, and this is what he did next at the temple. When he got into the temple, he turned over some tables. I mean, he is firing them out. And he says to the people, it is the most angry you've ever seen Jesus, right? And he is just flipping these tables over. He didn't say you couldn't sell cupcakes out in the lobby. That wasn't what he was saying. Some people shouldn't have a cafe in your church. That isn't what he's saying. Here's basically what they would do. You would come in, you had to have a lamb for Passover, right? It had to be a spotless lamb, had to be a perfect lamb, had to be a good lamb, healthy lamb. You'd bring yours in thinking I've done well with it and all this, and they'd look at it a little bit and they'd say, well, there's something wrong here. I'm sorry, that one won't work. But we have one over here we'll get for you. So we're gonna just take that one on back for you and, and uh, you can have this one. And they'd bring this one out. And you'd go your way with the new lamb you had just bought from them. And then guess what they would do? Somebody else comes up in line, well, your lamb isn't good, but we've got one back here, and they bring your lamb out and sell it to them. Jesus says, you don't make my house a house of robbers. Now, the next day, they were right back in business, of course. But he said, don't do that. If I use the idea of that, what's he do? He comes into our heart, and he says, well, you know this area of your life? You need it. Let me change that. You've got an attitude that stinks. Nobody wants to be around you. Or you're using language here that just isn't becoming. I'm going to help you out with that. Or maybe you've been cheating over here. Uh, we don't do that in my kingdom. My kingdom. And we pray at the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what we're praying. Your kingdom, your kingdom. And you know what else? Then he told them this will be a house of prayer. So he not only cleaned it, but now he refocused it. And that's what he does in our life. He says, I'll refocus you. And when he refocuses us, he gives us purpose. Our destiny becomes clear to us of what we're supposed to do. And we begin walking in the light that he talks about, 1 John. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us now. And we surrender ourselves to his lordship. And he works in our life. And he makes us more and more like Jesus. Have you made him king of your heart? king of your life. That's what it's all about. He will help you in your marriage. He will help you with your kids. He will help you with your employer. He will help you through your life. And when you come down to your point of death, which we will, we had a funeral last week, have another one coming up. When you come down to your point of death, let me say this very kindly, you don't want to have to take care of any business except dying. You want to just be able to come to death and die and not have to go say, forgive me, I was a jerk. I'm sorry I treated you this way. That's a wrong way to go. You want to be able to come to the end with a very clear conscience and a very clear record and say, here I am, Lord. Walk me through. And as David said, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear any evil. Why? Because your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You're king of my life. He's a good shepherd. He's a chief shepherd. He's a saving shepherd. <sighs> do you feel his embrace this morning? Do you sense his embrace? I do. It's a tough passage to teach. I've been doing it for 30 whatever years. 
but I hope to have given it to you in a clear way today that you can take it and you can roll with it. Because whatever you do with Jesus is all that matters. That's it. Hmm. Jesus, on this moment, as this service has come to this point, I pray that if anyone is here who has not yet made you Lord and King, that they would just simply say, God, I give up and come in. You just take my life. Make me who you want me to be. Take my sins. Forgive me, please. Lord, I want you to guide me. And as best I know, I'll follow you through your Holy Spirit, through your scriptures. And let me follow you all the days of my life that I may one day dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Lord, thank you for your patience. If there's some here that have been wrestling with lordship and kingship, with some particular area of their life, and it is a sanctifying moment where you are not just their savior, but the sanctifier of that area. And pray that you would help for there to be no hold back. You say, Lord, I don't know what to do about it, but I give it to you and just trust you'll guide me. Forgive us clearly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>